Rebecca Lubach, and I'm a guest here with, with I speak at Revive, so it just came out of my mouth. I'm sorry. I'm here tonight at Momentum, excited to be with all of you moms. Uh, I live in Grimes with my husband. We have three sons, ages 7, 5, and 15 months, so we're just stepping foot into the elementary world, but still very firmly planted into the toddler preschool years, too, so that's kind of where we're at in our parenting, and I'm busy, just like all of us. So tonight, we are talking about the badge of busyness. Have you heard this term? Why this topic? Maybe you've noticed this phenomenon lately. Think of the last time you ran into someone out and about or at church or an event, and you ask each other, how are you? What's the response typically? Busy, right? Right? The most common response we hear these days is, I'm busy, or we've been keeping busy, or I'm so busy with this. Or another way of identifying this is this situation. Imagine you are trying to get a group of four couples together for a weekend away together, or even just a night out. <laughs> How difficult is it, right, to get this on the calendar? So we have this badge of busyness in our culture, but busyness really is an issue. We are at living at such a pace that we can't keep up, and we're frantic and frenzied and trying to multitask, and it isn't working. Busyness has become a badge, a description for our state of being, and we know this isn't good, don't we? Now, I didn't come up with this topic for tonight. I think it kind of came out of Christine's mouth, and I'm putting you on the spot now, Christine. Did you come up with that term, badge of busyness, or was that Pastor Mike, or? Yeah, I love it. Okay, I just didn't know, and I hadn't asked you earlier, but I was just curious if that was a common term. But uh, as we move forward tonight, I just want to clarify here at the beginning, we are all moms here tonight, and motherhood by nature is demanding. It is full of activity, and it can feel draining. It can feel never-ending. So motherhood in itself just can feel very busy and very activity-filled. I want to acknowledge this. <laughs> I feel this way about parenting. It is so rewarding and fulfilling um, and wonderful, but it can, it can feel busy and full. And at the end of the day, perhaps, you know, maybe I didn't even leave the house that day except to go do school pickup, but I'm tired because I was poured out all day parenting. And I have a 15-month-old, so many of you can relate to that type of demanding. <laughs> That, you know, it's just demanding and draining. So that is definitely a type of busyness and fullness um, and challenge. But we are talking about something different tonight, you know, because that kind of busyness drains us, but it's rewarding as well. We're talking about the badge of busyness, the state of being that our culture has come to, where we find ourselves defining our identity and lifestyle as constantly busy, on the go, overcommitted, overscheduled, and frazzled. So a couple months ago, I asked this question to my Facebook friends because I wanted to do some research. Do you think busyness is an issue in our culture? Why or why not? If so, what are some ramifications and or solutions? Thanks for your help. TIA, thanks in advance. Um, <laughs> and so I just love social media and Facebook because I got a lot of feedback, a lot of great responses, you know, from all walks of life because that's your, your social media. It's people from high school or your current church, you know, college friends. So I'm just going to read a couple answers that really stood out, but so many of them were insightful and interesting. This is my friend Tom from high school. People like to brag about how busy they are and how much unpaid overtime they work because everything is a contest where we associate a very specific kind of struggle with virtue. This applies to ourselves and our children because overscheduled children have become a status symbol that is associated with quality parenting. He was always the smartest boy in my class. I'm not kidding. <laughs> he was. Tom Chang. Uh, my friend Debbie. I agree with so many of the points made already and would add that I think it's becoming quickly a drug to feed a stimulus addiction. We crave the stimulus that comes with being busy and multitasking. Busyness takes us away from other problems, allows us to avoid issues, and virtually receive a badge of honor. See, you don't even know Debbie, Christine, but she said it. Receive a badge of honor for doing so. I have so many thoughts on this topic. What a great and timely topic, as I think we are just on the verge of realizing what this is doing to our culture. 
Isn't that interesting? So, so many responses, people saying, yes, it's an issue. I'm sure you feel it too. And I have personal problems with busyness. I'm just here to confess that and admit it. Um, you know, it's funny. We treat money as a finite thing. We know how much money we have, or maybe our spouse knows. <laughs> but we know that it comes to an end. And if we don't have a certain amount, we won't spend it if we are wise. But we don't treat time that way, do we? But time is finite as well. We only have 24 hours every day. It doesn't change. And just once every four years do we get an extra day on the calendar leap day. So you have to make that one really count. But I tend to treat time as if it's infinite. And I think, oh, here's an opening so I can fit this in here without thinking about the ramifications about what that means for my self, my own energy, my family, my relationships. I seem to think I can fit more activities into an already full day. Anywho, maybe you can relate. I get too busy. I get stressed. I let things in the house go, which adds to my stress. I get short with my husband and kids, but the primary relationships in my life. I let my time with God go. Then I get downright ugly with myself, shaming myself. My self-talk turns very negative. I feel defeated, and I get really down. And I know I'm not alone. Research out of the University of California, San Francisco, found that when people have a hard time saying no, they are more likely to experience stress, burnout, and even depression. So it really is an issue. But did you know that even scripture talks about busyness? I was praying for momentum this fall, and I was reading through some psalms, and look what I found in Psalm 39. Matt, you can, sh you can bring that up. Verses 4 through 6. It says this, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. We are merely moving shadows, and all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Isn't that kind of sobering to take a moment and just think about how our lives are but a breath? And all our busy rushing ends in nothing. So what is the point of all this busyness? It begs the question, what is the point? Why do we do this? How did we get here? So we know that our culture is crazy busy. Just the world we live in as moms right now, it's a very broad topic, busyness is. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I learned, you know, there's articles, there's books, there's so many resources. There's much to discuss, uh, much more than time will allow tonight, and more isn't always better anyway, right? So I just have three suggestions for us as moms tonight about kind of how we got here and why our culture is this way, um, specifically for moms. So you can go to the next slide again. Thank you, Matt. Number one, um, different opportunities for women. I'm calling it She Has It All. So did you know it hasn't even been 100 years since women first gained the right to vote? 1919, I believe, was when they uh, passed that or ratified it. Maybe it was the next year. I'm not sure. But that's not even 100 years ago. So there might even be women alive today, old, 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 old women, <laughs> who saw that come to be. So the culture has shifted dramatically for us as women, and we have opportunities like never before. Not, not like the women who've gone before us, who we stand on their shoulders. They paved the way for us when it comes to opportunities for work, for education, for employment, just opportunities for lifestyle. We've just never had those before, and it's wonderful in so many ways. We are thankful for that, for the work that has gone before us. We are out-graduating men, I've, I've read. Uh, we just have more opportunities, higher job opportunities. But this takes its toll because now we have this image of a woman who has it all. She's a CEO. She's an awesome mom. She only serves organic food. She always looks great. She works out every day. She loves God. She volunteers at her church. She has all these gifts, amazing husband. Their marriage is rock solid. And she's rested. You know, this kind of, it's totally a myth. It's a myth. It's a facade. But because we have all these wonderful opportunities, that's kind of the flip side of the coin, right? So that's one reason that we are busy, just because we have these amazing opportunities, and we want to say yes to so many things. Number two, kinderarchy. Okay? So this is a new word. It's a book by an author named Joseph Epstein. I learned about it in this little book called Crazy Busy. 
You know what a monarchy is, right? Monarchy is a government or a state that's ruled by a king. Well, kinderarchy is a state that's ruled by children. And so this is the culture we live in now, and Christine alluded to this at um, the October Momentum as well, that we live in a very kid-centric culture, and it's just, it just hasn't been this way. So this author, Joseph Epstein, he's in his 60s, and listen to his childhood experience. He recalls never being unhappy as a kid, and yet his experience as a child might be considered almost criminal today. Let me read it to you. He says this, My mother never read to me, and my father took me to no ball games, though we did go to Golden Gloves fights a few times. When I began my modest athletic career, my parents never came to any of my games, and I should have been embarrassed had they done so. My parents never met any of my girlfriends in high school. No photographic or video record exists of my uneven progress through early life. My father never explained about the birds and the bees to me. His entire advice on sex, as I clearly remember, was, you want to be careful. <laughs> and remember, he never recalls being unhappy as a kid. That was the culture they grew up in, these, you know, this, the culture above us. I even, my husband and I were watching a comedian the other night, and he even talked about this. He's like, kids rule these days. I remember being in our family um, minivan, going on a road trip, my three siblings and I in the back, long road trip, and we see off in the distance the golden arches, you know, McDonald's. So all four of us kids, we start chanting, McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. And then we pull up, my dad, you know, goes into the drive-thru and orders, one small black coffee <laughs> and drove off. <laughs> That's the one thing at McDonald's that no kids want. I mean, he just was tough as nails, I think, but he's like, it's just different. There are numerous opportunities for our kids. Christine really talked about this, and it was great. She helped us kind of navigate that. More activities, more driving our kids to places, more organizing schedules. We feel like we need to keep up, or our kids are going to be behind. And it's funny that you talked about Mandarin in the skip because I actually have a friend whose kids are learning Mandarin. They live in the Twin Cities. And my first response when I heard that was, oh my goodness, my kids are not learning Mandarin. <laughs> I mean, they are barely learning English, you know? <laughs> like reading and writing, one language. And they're going to be behind in the global economy. I mean, it really feels that way under this kinderarchy. So the last um, suggestion for why we're so busy is this high-tech world, which of course you understand. We are plugged in all the time, and this really only happened two to three years ago when we got our smartphones, right? Um, and I'm of a generation where I remember my dad saying to me, we had a home computer, but he said, you know, someday you're going to be able to order food and order things on your computer and it will come to your house. And I was like, whatever, <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I went to college and had my first email account. And you guys, true story, I printed off all my emails because I'm so sentimental. I wanted to save my notes from my friends. Because in high school, you save notes, you know, in junior high. <laughs> anyway, I don't have them anymore, thank goodness. That would be a hoarding issue <laughs> that we need to talk about. But we are now plugged in all the time. And so that simply means that work and communication never stop. So it's so hard to take a break from that constant contact. We can be distracted far more easily, which I have a personality like that. Like, I'm like, oh, squirrel. Like, oh, Gwen and Blake are dating? Like, now I need to find out about this. Like, it's not important, but I go there. I get distracted. <laughs> and our communication is so fast-paced that it can be beneficial and quick. But the quantity of communication has increased so much that it creates more work and busyness for us, and it can feel overwhelming, honestly. Technology feeds that need for connection, but it be can become an addiction, a distraction from deep connection. So those are just three possible causes for our badge of busyness culture for moms. It's good to be aware of these. But the last thing I want tonight to be about is just, you know, to create strategies on how to fight these things, to give you more things to do, to help you create lists of how to fight technology or how to build a calendar that works for your family. And my close friends that are here tonight know that I would be the last person to tell you about those things because administration and organization is not my strength anyway. You see, no matter what our culture says or does, or how it changes over time, busyness is a heart issue. 
And this is where we will focus tonight. There's an author, a writer, a pastor, Eugene Peterson. You've heard of him. He wrote the message version of the Bible. Uh, this summer, before I knew I was even speaking on this topic, I was reading a little devotional and came across this quote from Eugene. So I'm going to read it to you. I have it on the slides. I'm going to read it twice and just kind of let it sink in and soak over us. I am busy because I am vain. I want to appear important. What better way than to be busy? The incredible hours, the crowded schedule, and the heavy demands of my time are proof to myself and to all who will notice that I am important. If I go to a doctor's office and find there is no one waiting, and I see through a half-open door the doctor reading a book, I wonder if he's any good. Such experiences affect me. I live in a society in which crowded schedules and harassed conditions are evidence of importance, so I develop a crowded schedule and harassed conditions. When others notice, they acknowledge my significance and my vanity is fed. I am busy because I am lazy. I let others decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding myself. It was a favorite theme of C.S. Lewis that only lazy people work hard. By lazily abdicating the essential work of deciding and directing, establishing values and setting goals, other people do it for us. And he wrote this in 1989. Isn't that something? way before technology. Okay, could you, would you mind going back, Matt? I'm just going to read these again. I am busy because I am vain. I want to appear important. What better way than to be busy? The incredible hours, the crowded schedule, and the heavy demands of my time are proof to myself and to all who will notice that I am important. If I go into a doctor's office and find there is no one waiting and I see through a half-open door that doctor reading a book, I wonder if he's any good. Such experiences affect me. I live in a society in which crowded schedules and harassed conditions are evidence of importance, so I develop a crowded schedule and harassed conditions. When others notice, they acknowledge my significance and my vanity is fed. I am busy because I am lazy. I let others decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding myself. It was a favorite theme of C.S. Lewis that only lazy people work hard. By lazily abdicating the essential work of deciding and directing, establishing values, and setting goals, other people do it for us. And this just, I just ruminated on this. This was so interesting to me. The vain, the vain part, the, the proud part, that registered with me, but the lazy part, I thought that was so intriguing because how can I be lazy? I'm busy all the time. So we'll get to that. But let's unpack these two, harsh, these two heart issues a bit. So the first one, um, Eugene calls it vanity, but we're just going to call it pride. This issue of wanting to appear important or an elevated sense of ourself based on our performance, our activities, our work, the things we do, the striving to find our self-worth, the schedule we keep. Pride might be hard to define, but we know what it is when we see it in other people and in ourselves. And so one of the best ways to combat pride in our hearts, and of course the first thing we do is we confess and we repent of it. And that's so simple. We let Jesus do the heavy lifting for us. All we have to do is confess and repent. But one of the best ways to combat pride in our hearts is to rest or to cease. We stop working. We stop striving. We stop being busy. We just cease. We take a break. And did you know this concept is actually in the Bible? In Genesis, you know where I'm going. So I'm going to just read to you briefly. You've heard this story so many times. Genesis 1, verse 31, and just a couple verses. God looked, then God looked over all that he had made, and he saw that it was very good. Evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work and God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So God rested on the seventh day. But that begs the question, why? Why did God rest? God, when we rest, when we get tired, when we've expended energy and we have no energy left, we rest to be restored. But God is God. He doesn't get tired. So why would God rest? What does rest mean for God? 
Well, the creation account tells us that, you know, God creates everything, and it gets more complicated as he goes. He starts with space and light and sky, and he calls that good. And then earth, dirt, he calls that good, and plants, good. But then at the end of it, he calls all of creation very good. So what we learn about rest for God is that his finished work, his creation was very good. Rest for God is ceasing from work because he found satisfaction in his finished work. Did you follow that? Rest for God is ceasing from work because he found satisfaction in his finished work. I, it's not just about relaxing or taking a break from ongoing work. I know as a mom, I feel like things never get finished. Are you kidding me? I get laundry done and there's more laundry to do. I do the dishes and there's more dishes to do. I wipe a knee and there's another injury. I put out a fire between two kids and the other child needs me. I mean, it feels never ending. And so it's not just taking a break from ongoing work, but rest for God is ceasing from work because he found satisfaction in his finished work. Isn't it interesting that we take most of God's Ten Commandments pretty seriously? We would never commit murder, adultery. We would never steal. We try not to worship idols. But the commandment to rest one day a week or keep the Sabbath, we just disregard it. I do. I admit it. Our culture does. In fact, in this badge of busyness world, you almost receive affirmation or praise for breaking that commandment, right? So isn't that interesting? But if we know what rest really is, it helps us to obey it. Because we think, oh, Sabbath keeping, that's just old-fashioned. Or how is that even possible in this world? I have so much going on. Parenting never ends. That's just not realistic. But if rest is ceasing from work because there is satisfaction in the finished work, it helps us to obey it. When I talk about Sabbath keeping with friends or other people or my husband, their eyes just glaze over. I mean, it just sounds really boring, right? And unrealistic and just not for us. But Sabbath keeping simply means that we gladly cease our work and our activity, our busyness, even though it may be ongoing, to enter into the rest that only God can give us. And you know what that rest is? We get to rest from striving, working, trying to prove ourselves, and our worth, and we rest on the work that Jesus did on the cross. Jesus cried out, it is finished, when he was on the cross. What was finished? His mission was finished. His mission was to overcome evil, wickedness, sin, pain, terror, terrorism, evil, and pride. That restless need to prove our worth, to strive to be important and worthy. His mission set us free from slavery to work. And striving, isn't that wonderful? And so when we keep the Sabbath, we get to enter into that rest. We are able to remember who we are and whose we are. It helps us remember that God is in control, that we are not, and we can trust him. It helps us humble ourselves because we stop striving. and We stop trying to prove our worth, our importance, by what we do, our work, our kids' performances, our kids' activities, because we are dearly loved. We are precious. We are gifted, we are called, we have worth. The God of the universe gives us our worth, not what we do. And so we can rest, we can cease, we can take a break because of his finished work. I read somewhere that we need to look at rest as a weapon, as an offensive tool to fight. Rest is proactive, rest is obedient. So just a few practical tips because that was pretty philosophical. So just in general in life, you know, to combat pride, ask yourself, why am I wanting to say yes to this opportunity? Is it to serve someone or is it to serve myself? Because many of our, all of our opportunities are good. Nothing is bad. Kids' activities are not bad. Serving at church is not bad. Serving at a charity is not bad. Helping a friend is not bad. All of these are good, right? But why are you wanting to say yes to this opportunity? Is it to serve someone or to serve myself? Here's another little practical thing you can do. Um, I'm working on just say no. You don't have to give an explanation. As women, we like to please people, and so we often have to say, oh, I can't, I have a prayer commitment, or I just, I'm so sorry, I wish I could, but I have this. But just say no. We don't owe them an explanation. Just say no. 
because we're protecting our margin, we're protecting our downtime, we're protecting our Sabbath, we can be like Phoebe on Friends. When they asked her to help, I think with Ross's move, if Cassie Marks were here, she would know because she knows Friends, like the back of her hand. Phoebe said, oh, I would love to help you, but I just don't want to. <laughs> That's freedom. That is freedom. Practically, we can help each other, honor the Sabbath, work that out with your spouse, with your primary relationships, with your friends. Maybe say, hey, I'm not going to respond to texts on Sunday. So just a heads up, just so you know, I'm, I'm trying that. Would you help me in that? And then lastly, just intentional Sabbath keeping. And I'm not talking about being legalistic at all. I have no interest in that. Just explore what that could look like for you. There's a wonderful book. It's called Keeping the Sabbath Holy. It's by a woman named Marva Don, and she kind of breaks down and unpacks this really beautiful Jewish culture and how they keep the Sabbath holy and all the things that they do. And if you're interested in that, if you like to nerd out on stuff like that, like I do, this might be helpful for you. But she talks about ceasing, resting, embracing, and feasting. This is not legalistic at all. I have images in my head of reading Little House on the Prairie when I was a little girl. And on Sundays, Laura and Mary had to sit on a hard chair for hours. That was their Sabbath, right? Heather's nodding your hand. You have a memory of that. That is not appeal to me. I would rather work than sit on a hard chair for hours and be quiet, you know? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about asking God and just saying to God, God, I am tired. My life is not working. Would you show me how I can get some rest? I want to enter into this rest that you offer me, Jesus. I don't know how to do it. I'm asking those questions too. It's not to be legalistic at all, but just to explore. Um, and you know what? Just give yourself lots of grace in this area. Just take baby steps. Maybe it's just asking your spouse, could I have one hour to myself on a Sunday where I could just take a nap and then um, read the Bible and journal or take a walk? You know, just an hour. Start with little baby steps to honor the Sabbath and learn about that. And it's not saying we're not going to do any activities on Sundays. It's just working that out, baby steps. Remember that there are different seasons for things. You know, maybe you're in a season where you were launching a business. You're starting a business or you're going back to school. You're going to have a push for a while you know, a couple years to get that going. You're going to work hard for a season and things aren't going to work out perfectly in your rhythm of rest and work. But give yourself grace. Maybe you're in a season where one of you is unemployed. Maybe keeping the Sabbath looks really different as you're seeking out new employment and trusting God for that. So please, just hear me. Lots of grace, but just explore. Second heart issue, laziness. Isn't that interesting? We're busy because we are lazy. I never thought of that. The idea that we are not intentional with directing our values and decisions, so we lazily let other people do it for us. It's so interesting because, like I said, I don't feel lazy. I feel busy, and I feel tired <laughs> and frustrated that I miss out on the things I care about because I'm overcommitted. So this is actually true, isn't it? We're missing out on the things that matter because we overcommit ourselves, and we get into this busyness culture. And so what's really behind this idea of being lazy is fear. For me, it is. I have this fear I'm going to miss out. I'm going to disappoint people if I say no. Um, what are they going to think of me? Uh, what are they going to think of my kids? Uh, fear of our kids missing out on opportunities. It's just fear, and it's ugly, and I hate that it holds us back and holds me back. So how do we combat fear? Again, you just confess and repent. So easy, just say it. And Jesus does the heavy lifting for you um, because he forgives, he forgives us. He did that work on the cross. But I do want to encourage you, take comfort in knowing that Jesus understands. I think sometimes we think, oh, busyness is such a first world or uh, century, whatever century we're in uh, <laughs> now, problem. <laughs> and Jesus can't relate. Wasn't a first century thing. But let me tell you something. Jesus had demands. Jesus had challenges. Jesus, you could almost say Jesus was busy. He could at least understand that. Listen to this. This is Mark 3, verse 21. I do not remember this verse at all. The book of Mark is very fast-paced. You get this sense that Jesus has um, very urgent, um, immediate. It's very quick, uh, all of that. But listen to this. One time Jesus entered a house, and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. 
When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Jesus did not have time to eat a meal. We can all relate to that, can't we? If you have had a baby, you know how that feels. Because when you have a baby, you can't even find time to trim your teen wolf toes. That's how I feel. Like, how where am I going to have time to eat or make a meal for my family? Jesus understands. I'm being funny, but the truth is that Jesus understands the demands that we face. Listen to this again from Crazy Busy, and I promise I will wrap it up. Don't think Jesus can't sympathize with your busyness. You have bills that need to be paid. Jesus had lepers who wanted to be healed. You have kids screaming for you. Jesus had demons calling him by name. You have stress in your life. Jesus taught large crowds all over Judea and Galilee with people constantly trying to touch him, trick him, and kill him. He had every reason to be run over by a hundred expectations and a thousand great opportunities. So I find that very comforting that Jesus understands. He may have never been a mom, but he understands demands and people demanding his time and his attention. And I know we feel that way. So we find comfort in knowing that Jesus understands, but he didn't give in to that temptation. His mission, he stayed focused on his mission. His mission was the cross. He was focused on getting to Jerusalem and getting to the cross. He said no to some people. He didn't always heal everybody. He had to let things go to stay on mission. And so that's how we can combat fear and laziness by determining our missions and determining the essentials in our lives. And that's going to help us filter out. So what, are your, what is your mission? What are your essentials? As a person, as a family, there's a book out right now called Essentialism by Be- Greg McCowan, and it's the concept of ruthlessly focusing on that which is essential to achieve results. He says this, life is not an all-you-eat buffet. Essentialism is about finding the right food. More and more is valueless. Staying true to my purpose and being selective in what I take on results in a more meaningful, richer, and sweeter quality of life. Isn't that refreshing? Because we do live in this culture of more and more and more. we got to do this and this and this and be busy all the time. But this author is saying that instead of experiencing the fear of missing out, when you say no to things based on your essentials, based on your mission, you experience the joy of missing out. Because then you get to experience your essentials, whether that's time with your kids or your spouse or walking out your gifts and your calling. Maybe it's the work that you were created to do. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe it's the kids that you are teaching. Who who knows? Whatever it is, it's specific to you and how God created you. So again, nothing legalistic here. Just loads of grace. And I encourage you to work that out. What are your essentials? And Christine led the way in that for us last month when she said, what are your values as a family? And that was so helpful. So I encourage you to continue to do that. Take the time with your spouse and your primary relationships. Give your space, yourself space and grace to do it. And again, they may change in different seasons of life. Know that there are certain seasons of great acti- greater activity or work depends on the ages of your kids and what activities they're involved in, what their gifts are. Uh, But my husband and I are starting this process. Our goal is to come up with five essentials that we can stand on and make decisions. And we're just feeling this out and it's taking some time. But God will lead you. Just ask him. He loves to give us wisdom. One thing that we've come up with, one essential, we're calling it growing in intimacy. And that's kind of an umbrella term that covers intimacy with God and intimacy with each other. Because those are kind of my primary relationships forever. <laughs> God and my husband. And so how, are, how am I going to set myself up so that that can be essential, that can be foundational my whole life, that I have connection and time with God and my husband. Because the truth is, the world, the culture is not on board with me having a strong marriage. They're just going to take as much as me as they can, right? There's always opportunities to volunteer and get involved and be busy. So we have to make it an essential. And again, Sabbath keeping, practicing that, that is going to help you with your essentials and it's going to help you combat fear. Because what happens is when we step back and rest and cease, we reminded that God is in control, that he loves us, that he has a plan, that his work is finished, that we don't have to be afraid. We are his precious daughters, called, gifted, and loved perfectly. 
so what is the point of all this busyness? <laughs> all our busy rushing ends in nothing. Our need to prove ourselves, our worth through our performance, our work is finished on the cross. We don't have to be slaves to work or to busyness or to fear. Isn't that so marvelous? We can cast all our cares upon God because he cares for us. He sees all of our days. Even though our lives may be but a breath, he sees all of our days and he cares for us. And so uh, before we move into our time of discussion, I'm gonna, we're going to play a song and the lyrics are going to be playing up on the screen. So I invite you to just sit quietly, read the lyrics, kind of take them in or just sit quietly and pray. Or if you need to journal, if you have something going on in your heart, write that down um, or take a nap, five minute nap. I'm all about power naps. I really am. Totally. So you are invited to do that. This song is called I Am by Nicole Nordman. I'm kind of weird. It's like super old, like 15 years old, like 14 years old, something like that. But still, um, my heart just beats when I hear it and it touches me. So just enjoy it. And then I will come back up and, and get us going into our discussion time. <laughs> So we're just going to go right into discussion, is that right? And we will have the discussion questions on the screen. They are working so diligently on that. And so would you get into groups of about three or four, five, whatever you feel comfortable with. Just make sure nobody's off by themselves. And um, you have 20 minutes or so to kind of discuss these things or whatever's on your heart. This is a safe place. And just enjoy that time of community and talking some of these things out and encouraging one another. So enjoy. Enjoy. 